Yeah, the error message is gone. It's good. So we can start. <sighs> Take it away, Olga. Yes, few words. First, thank you very much for all of you to come. It's just such a pleasure to see your faces, your names, and thinking that you are listening to us. I'm going to say a few words before Jeanette takes it over. So let's imagine that you're coming out from midway into the medallion and you see this famous urbanistic garden over there. And what is uh, seen uh, very often over there is one fine lady who is taking care of all inhabitants and visitors of that garden, uh, plants and birds and rocks and people. And then imagine that you're coming out, exiting the elevator on the fifth floor of this building. And you find yourself in the beautiful green garden full of warm light and cool green shade. Who's there? The same fine lady is there caring for everything which is around her. This is Jeanette. And if you're a lucky person, no. this fine lady no. Jeanette is waiting Wait. for you and she invites you to join her uh, over there, under the um, friendly shade of the garden, to talk about how to better serve to the evolution of humanity. So the question is, how? And how Jeanette herself is performing the service? You're gonna, know, you're gonna come to know it very soon because. Jeanette's argument is very convincing, I promise you. But before it's happening, I want to repeat after Jeanette one stance, which is very dear to me. And the stance is something like that, the, the salvation of the world and or all of us is going to happen owing to the uh, offering of artists of their incredible gift of love, their art. All right, now Jeanette, take it on. I'm going to share my screen. I've prepared some slides for you. Let's make sure I can get this to work. And let me get my chat box opened if I need it. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Olga. Jeanette, I told your inspiration. I'm just, I'm just the introducer. <laughs> All the work is yours. So I'm going to share with you what I'm thinking about these days related to my art and the work that I do with students. I have prepared a little slideshow and I'm going to start by simply showing you a few of the slides. I will be silent in the very beginning here. There's not a problem with the audio. So I wish to thank Olga for inviting me to have this conversation with you. When I moved to Midway, it was the September before the beginning of the pandemic in the US, I quickly unpacked my boxes and I ran off to teach. I teach at MassArt, I teach writing at MassArt. And then we were suddenly 
locked down and I didn't get to meet anybody or have conversations with you. And so I was very grateful for any friendliness in the elevator and you were friendly with me. And I was also very grateful when the 89 Midway Studios art talk started because I began to come to understand a few individuals and some of your work. Oh. So I've mentioned, and I do, when people ask me in the elevator, what do you do? Sometimes I make the mistake of saying I teach writing at Mass Art because this uh, doesn't always um, encourage more conversation with visual artists. And I'd like to talk to you for a moment about how I do that, how I do that work with young visual artists. My focus is on form conscious nonfiction writing. This term comes from the Washuta and Waburton, who have produced just a beautiful anthology recently, The Shapes of Native, Native Nonfiction Writing. And they, in their introduction, talk about the importance of the structure of the vessel and the content working together. You all know this, you're all visual artists um, and performing artists. And so you already know this, but not all writers work this way. And so when I begin to uh, introduce myself to the visual artists that I work with, I start here. I start with the idea that the weave of the basket will indeed influence the content and that the shape of the canoe will determine what kind of fishing you can do with that canoe. And that the page, the shape of the page creates the shape of the form. And form is the work of imagination, bringing order, intent, interpretation to the raw and remembered experiences that we have. So what might this look like? for a visual artist when I tell them we're going to work on experimental essays. They may bring in the first round of essays to me, an essay, a personal essay on their experience with stress in the form of a nutrition panel on the side of a cereal box because they are mixing these two together. And the minute I tell them they can do that, they said, we have this one, Jeanette, not to worry. <laughs> we, we know exactly what to do here. And so they take the ingredients and they place their essay in these short, concise forms, or perhaps they show up with an essay on their growth on this terrific period of transition that they're in, in the 18, 17, 18 and 19 year old years. And they use a departure gate from an airport or the departure board from an airport to express what they wish to say about this topic. In both these instances, this idea of looking at the inner and integrating it with the outward journey, they're woven together when they are allowed to use writing in this form. So that's the way that I work with visual artists at Mass Art. There are visual artists who do this work. Adelheid Mares is one of my teachers. She's at the University of Chicago and she works on different forms of knowledge and how those ought to be expressed to articulate cultural and so social contexts. I use her work in the classrooms and I uh, recommend taking a look at her website. She interviews. Most of her research is interviewing visual artists and um, then articulating their processes in these various forms of artistic mind maps that she makes. So what does this mean for a person who writes and who works with visual artists and who creates journals? I also make artist books, which is the place where these two intersect together. So I do make my own journals and I'm copying in my little journals quotes from Henri Michaud who wrote and did visual art, because I don't think of my work as, I don't think of it. I hear a lot of people describe it's visual art or it's words, it's images or it's words, or it's um, um, somehow a, 
uh, a combining of the two or that. It isn't. I'm very interested in the intersection point between these two. And that's the space that I try to live in. I first started learning bookmaking from Peter Madden. Um, he was at the MFA school. I don't know if he's still there. Once Tufts took over the MFA school, I looked, uh, uh, looked him up and I didn't find his name there, but I did take courses from him for a number of years. And I played with the paper. I threw it into tea, different kinds of teas, rose tea and black tea to see what would happen with it and when did it disintegrate. And uh, because the paper is, the page is a very important part of my material. And I put woven fabrics on top of them and see what would happen. And this was all fine. I was having a delightful time very early on with Peter Madden making very pretty books. And then one day Peter came into class and he said, you know, we need, we're not just here to make pretty books. We need to do something with the insides of them. And I said, what? I have them lined up on my bookshelf. They're quite lovely. They are artifacts of their own. I'm, it's fine the way it is. No, no. Clearly Peter was having his own crisis in teaching and needed to take all of us to another place. So I went with him. I said, okay, fine, if we've got to put content inside these books and we need to work with them, these are complex stories we're talking about because I'm interested in representing the human experience. So I began with books inside books, which you've seen before, I'm sure. And I began to work with how can I get the information on the page? I've always been interested in the integration of the personal um, with the universal stories. And so my stories start there. Um, and this story here was a story about my mother and my grandmother and the line through the uh, feminine side of my family. Part of that early work was working with Pronto Prints because it was an easy form for me to use. Those Mylar forms where I could Xerox on them and then with water resist, use the color ink. I love sepia ink, brown is my favorite um, color to work with. And so it um, allowed me to do that. It allowed me to use artifacts from my collections without ruining them. So I worked on a book for a letter from my, grand, I, my grandmother. My grandmother wrote to me letters. That's the way that she stayed in contact with me when I was very, very young, moving all around. Um, she hung on to me. And this was fine. I was fine. I thought, it's interesting. It's working. I'm getting somewhere. But it wasn't enough for me. There wasn't enough of a feeling of the texture. And so I went to letterpress. I said, what if I had got a little more bumps on that page and got a little, got the letters to um, have a more tactile feel to them. And I took letterpress classes at MassArt with Keith. And um, experimented. Keith offered in one of the first courses I took, he had a graduate student who said in the evening he was going to offer a special seminar on making letters with circles. Well, I was interested in circles, so I said I would do it. I had no idea how ridiculously hard it would be to try to do this kind of work, but I primarily kept experimenting also with the page. How thin could I get the paper to be to go through this letterpress, and what would be the impact of that? I also worked with how small for the more intimate um, poems, such as Wendell Berry's Traveling at Home. Home is such an intimate um, experience, hopefully, for many of us. Uh, and then what did that feel like to take an image, take a poem of Wendell Berry's and print it quite small on the page and then touch it? Always, always, all the while, I had my eye on that torn edge of the page. Peter Madden changed my life in two ways. One, he taught me how to tear paper. Um, this was very freeing for me when he taught me that. And he also taught me that there was such a thing as a centering ruler. And I couldn't do math, so that was really very freeing to know that. So I kept playing with the texture on the page. I tried embossing. What if you had to feel the letters um, and you didn't have the opportunity to 
sort of see it quite so directly as you would with printed ink? What if I gave you both? What if you didn't have the patience for that? So maybe I gave you subtle thought in a direct um, way, but listening for subtle thoughts, the more quiet, experience, the, the more subtle experience you had to work for. A friend of mine, an artist friend was practicing with rust paper and she gave me pieces of her rust paper because she knew I was experimenting at the, um, at the letter press and experimenting with what could go through. So these, the paper, the rust paper itself was hers. I'll apologize now for this image. It's not as clear as I'd like it to be. I need to have it professionally photographed, uh, but it just is to give an idea of seeing, okay, what happens with the rust paper when I've taken a poem from uh, Jane Hirschfield on subtle thought, and I have uh, played with the shape of the images on the page. So this, was a dance for me between methods and materials. And I just kept dancing. I was very interested in, could I keep layering and layering thin sheets of paper um, and collage them together in a way that they become a single page with methyl cellulose? Um, because the layering was very important to me to communicate some things about the complexity of our human experiences. And I started putting it all together, the layering. I gel printed on top of this some prints of leaves. And then I said, okay, let's see now if it's this thick. I know thin paper goes through the letterpress. What about thick paper? Can I, I've got many layers here. Can I get it to work? And you'll notice again the edge of that page that that's where a lot of my focus is. Um, but the texture was clearly my language and the way light activates the language of texture interested me very, very much. The intimacy, this is a small book, it's about four by six and that was very important. And the feeling of it, the welcome, it was welcoming a new baby into the world. I continued to work on these ideas of how to express these powerful and intimate experiences. This is a book on motherhood for my older daughter. And again, you can see that I'm clearly beginning to understand, oh, so collage is your work. This takes years to figure these things out for me. I'm slow in my learning process, but now I've got the letterpress, I've got uh, photographs that are uh, Xeroxed on vellum because I thought that was interesting with these papers. And this is all placed on a very, um, it's not an illustrator's board, but it's a very thick board because the book that I made, I made folders, individual folders where these pages slipped out. Everything tea stained, including the twine and you can see the collage cover on this book um, that I'm working on. It will not come as a surprise to those of you who follow Midway Gardeners um, that I was very interested when I found this book a couple of years ago, Make Ink. So I'm driving down deeper into the materials. Can I blend these papers together with ink and work them in a different kind of way? And can I make my own ink? I'm only at the beginning of understanding what happens with making your own ink with plant. Um, it's always a surprise to me, for example, making with hibiscus flowers, ink starts red. And as it, when you're painting first, it's red. And when you dry, it turns blue. Um, this is just fantastic. I have my eye, it's in the garden. There are some plants, Oxidalus triangulus, that are, um, I think I'm gonna cut them soon and dry them in here because I think they're going to make fantastic purple. Um, I hope, I hope, we'll see. So I, I still am experimenting with this. It's gonna be, this will probably just go on forever now because you know my relationship with plants. And then I started saying, what 
happens with the brown. If I make my own brown, I make the best brown I've ever had. And I love Dick Bix Blix. You know, I'm thrilled that they can give me a walnut ink, but to get the walnut shells and make my own and then see what happens on the page, it's fantastic. And so this is just simply experiments that I'm showing you here. And I am um, playing with the ink and trying to understand it and understand it some properties and just keep getting closer and closer to it. Uh, so it's just on craft paper that I'm playing. However, just on craft paper, I start making a book again and you'll see I had to return to the word because the word's a part of it for me too. All the playing with ink that I want to do, the word still has its role and it will have its way with me wherever else I go. So with all of this experimentation, where do I go next? What happens next? Well, the pandemic happened to us and we have a responsibility during the pandemic as artists to document what this is like and what's going on. And I was very curious. It's one thing for all of us to be going through this pandemic. It's one thing for me to be working with solitude in brand new ways that I haven't worked with it before. There's a part of the pandemic for as difficult it is to be surrounded by so much death. Um, there's more time for awareness. There, there are things that are happening during this time. But I wondered about the 18-year-olds and the 19-year-olds and the 20-year-olds that had the expectation that they were going out. It was a time to be social. They're not interested in reading the books I'm reading on solitude and the way that I'm thinking about it. So I thought we have to document with them this time. We have to let them document their own experience. So I found this style of an artist book that I'm showing you that I thought would work because I was thinking about how do I, how do I mail to them parts of a book and bring the whole thing together? Because my idea was that ultimately we would create a set of artist books that we would give to the Mass Art Artist Book, Permanent Artist Book Library Collection. Mass Art has a um, very impressive I will say so, even though I work there, um, artist book collection. I belong to the New England Book Arts Association. And so I've seen a number of the collections around the area and Mass Art has been slowly collecting. They are a teaching library. And so their books won't last forever. Students are allowed to work with them. So this is the style that I chose. And then I began to work with the students that I work with. Oh, first I had to prepare them. I said, well, what am I going to do? So I took Sumi ink and painted the back of the boards, cut the boards down and got them ready. I'm very grateful for the midway space. My favorite is the foyer because I can lay the paper out and dry it. So that's what makes me happy to have all of this space to do this work. Other than the ceiling too. I like the high ceilings. You know, you're flying around here with your thoughts and you need room to be able to do that. So I'm producing these and then I gave them to them and I said, I'd like you to share one moment during the pandemic, any moment, one moment, one thought. Because of course that is um, what's needed in art in writing is the more you give to the particular, the more you can actually give to your art. And so one of them that came in, in with a student last semester is her worry about what experience her nieces and nephews are going to remember in this time. Another one came in from a woman who worked at Target during this time. And it was the only social contact she had was with the other people that worked in Target in the staff room. And what they used to talk about is how peculiar it was that people came into Target and they insisted on buying the clothing off the mannequins. They did not want the clothing from the, do not take them to the racks to buy the clothing. They wanted it off the mannequins. And this is what she remembered. Another student who moved deeply into a period of reflection went back and studied his grandmother's watercolors and started producing some of his own watercolors. 
and yet another student uh, who started with me last year. He had his own business already going, selling t-shirts and uh, designing things. Um, he had to step out for a while. He His business supports his parents who live with him. Uh, and then his aunt became ill and he had to step out and he's just back with us now. I suspect his image is going to be very different, the one that he will give me this semester. So this idea of our responsibility to document and to show this time, this is one of my ways of meeting that. And it's the same as what I was showing you in the first slides. It is where the inner and the outer journeys are woven together. Here, it's where the day-to-day -day living is integrated with global concerns. And that's what I've come to understand is this theme that I am working with. For five years, I have curated a show that I call Why I Write, Why I Create. It's an invite-only show um, for young artists where I ask them to just answer that prompt. Why do you write? Why do you create? Say anything you want. Tell a story. They can have 200 to 300 words. Uh, the first year that we did it, they're on large. They're then um, put on very large posters, 30 by 40 inches and hung in the mass art space. The first year that I did this, I was very, very nervous. They had never had a show like this before. They'd never had a word show or a story show. It is a visual art school, the dominant uh, mode and design. These are its dominant modes. And when I first went there, I've now worked there full time for the last um, five, six years, but at first it was a visiting professor. And when I was there, I would just hear people, and it, all kinds of people say, oh, our students don't write. And this was just not true. It was not true in my classes. It was not true what was happening. My students were showing me their journals and what was going on. And I wanted to show them that it wasn't true. I was very nervous the first year because I was afraid that they weren't going to treat them well. That students who were willing to be um, so open to share the truth of a story um, that it might not work. I had nothing to worry about. They were so generous, not just the art faculty, the staff, not just the staff. I'm not talking like the high level staff. They don't come to these things. They're always too busy. Everyone, staff from all over the institution and the students. These students were telling us stories. And at first I didn't understand what was happening. I just did it. I just kept doing it. I had an instinct that it should happen. But they, in fact, were showing us stories that were beginning to lead us out of dualistic thinking, such as Veronica Pedroza, who writes, I'm trying to say that we are constantly classified in, into a simplified spectrum from light to dark. But I'm also trying to say that once we transpass and we actually get to know people's experience, we access a different dimension of life. And we become truly present in a civilized world with the true spectrum of infinite color. The young artists who were coming forward were showing us how to reimagine our relationship with the unknown. As David Troyce said, I write to solve problems of the problems I create myself to solve. I write to then realize the problems are also the creation of our minds. For we humans have no reason to exist if we have nothing to solve. I write to see my face in the absence of a mirror to remind myself that we are more thought than pure matter. These stories were showing me how our young artist, the next upcoming generation, was helping us to redefine our relationship with humanity. I did an interview a number of years ago with the nature writer, Terry Tempest Williams, and I've never forgotten this part of the quote when she said, it's no longer about survival of the fittest, Jeanette. It's about the survival of compassion. I think she's right. So for the survival of compassion, another one that came in, this one's from Darrell Hunt. 
one of the things that they do in my classes is they redefine the words. So Durrell went and looked up the definition of black from a 2007 uh, online Webster dictionary. And then they cross out what is not true. And so the entire front is completely crossed out for him, which says this, that which is a destitute of light or whiteness, or rather destitution as the cloth is a good black, black as the badge of hell. All of this is crossed out. And instead, he takes us to the true place of humanity. Black is a member of the color wheel, a tone's neighbor determined by the darkness of its hue. It represents what it is to be strong, both mentally and emotionally, to be able to take the pain of indifference in contrast with other members of the color wheel. Black should be prideful of its creation in this world. Black is the accurate role model of what it is to be a color. It's a color that should symbolize hope for every color. So they're leading us out of dualistic thinking. They're reimagining our relationship with the unknown and they're helping us redefine our relationship with humanity. I didn't see this at first. In fact, I spent most of this summer quite confused walking around trying to figure out what can I do? What do I do with this program that I've had for five years? I did have a plan at the pandemic. I, in fact, I secured funding to do a five-year documentary for it, a fifth-year documentary for it. Soon Me You from the film department was going to bring in some of her students. We actually started filming it and started collecting some of the footage for it, interviewing some students. And that was in February of 2020. So in March, all the money disappeared because um, it was just sucked right back up into um, the all the worlds that that money disappears into and everything went quiet. So I've been walking around this summer thinking, what do I do? How do I? Mostly I've been walking around confused. I know I may not look confused if you see me out in the garden. I may even look purposeful in what I'm doing. But mostly I was thinking, what do I do? How do I grow this program? Where do I take it to its next evolution? And what does that even mean to do that? And it was in that confusion that I went back and I looked and I began to see, oh my goodness, they're bringing us forward. I didn't see the things that I'm showing you now and saying how they are showing us about uh, our relationships with the unknown and how to think about humanity. I didn't see that until... I allowed myself to be very confused all summer. Um, and I am interested, this, can, this, this holds me, not five years, but more. What, what is the evolution of this look like? So for me to partly answer that question, uh, when the numbers were low, the, meaning the COVID numbers in our area, I did travel to Minnesota. I have, followed and had conversations over time with Richard Bresnahan now since about 2010. Richard Bresnahan, when he finished his undergraduate work, went and did an internship, uh, an apprenticeship rather, I'm sorry, and um, in Japan in pottery. And he was there for a number of years. And then he came back to St. John's. He didn't take any academic positions. Oh, and, and what he was learning there was how to integrate his practice of pottery with the land and with the community. This was what had most impressed him. So he came back to St. John's and St. John's said, okay, we're, we're a liberal arts school. They, uh, it's founded by the Benedictine monks. And they said, we will um, we'll support you for two years. You have to be able to fund yourself at that point. Well, it's 40 years later now. And yes, he went through a lot and he's trained a lot of apprentices. So partly this summer, I went back just to sit next to him. He didn't even have to talk to me about it. Although um, he does uh, talk because he lives within the Benedictine tradition. You show up at his door and he serves you tea and you have conversations uh, together. It's how it started for me in 2010. I saw him, I, 
I just saw a video and I was interested in his way of integrating the community. He was the first one when he came back to build the largest wood fired kiln, outdoor wood fire kiln in the US. I don't know if it's still the largest. Um, the clay comes from the Minnesota land. He was gifted it when someone showed him where the clay was. And uh, this, and it's a community experience once a year or once every two years where the whole community gets together and the firing happens and artists come from all over. More than 10,000 pieces are fired when this work is done. So I went and just sat with him and sat with his apprentice and talked and tried to get myself to think about where do I take this next? Because for storytelling artists, the only myth worth telling in the near future is one that's focused on society and the planet, how to relate to society, to the world of nature and the cosmos. Joseph Campbell told us in the last years of his life, he's a mythologist who they, um, they videotaped in the last years of life. He was a bit of a recluse a scholar and they recognized they didn't have anything. So they started videotaping him in the late eighties. And he said, it's the myths. The reason we don't have any myths we're living by is because first of all, the symbols don't mean anything to us. Science has proven the symbols of the old myths are no longer relatable. We don't relate to them. More importantly, a myth, the myth of the tribe is not, does not serve humanity any longer. Humanity will need to move to myths that relate them to nature and the cosmos and the earth overall. So I live my days thinking about and watching and listening, trying to listen with a very particular ear to what is the next generation bringing forward? They were born into all of this in a very different way. They are very um, aware of this relationship between navigating day-to-day -day living with global concerns that are never going to go away in their time. They know they own them, but they're myths that, that they bring forward that will need to awaken all of us to a sense of awe, a sense of gratitude, and even rapture, I would say, as Joseph Campbell did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Jeanette. It was, it was just lovely. I know that your, your talk is like what, as I once said to you, it is like water which is running and you're enchanted with the sounds of that water. I was just taken away and I don't know how to formulate my own impression, but just it is so pleasant now to think about possibilities of future instead of being afraid of them. So that is what you have done to us today you've taken you've taken away the stresses and the fears that we are all struggling with even for these minutes that we were listening to you and i'm still under impression of it. i don't know how the other listeners and watchers and spectators are feeling just judging by their faces, they are probably on my side. Um, I just wanted to say, when you introduced yourself to me, Jeanette, you told me you taught memoir. You don't teach memoir. You teach something far different. So I'm really glad I got to see what you're doing. Thank you. So the connection to memoir, Souther, um, at the time that Joseph Campbell in the late 80s said we were living in a time with no myths to guide us and we need myths. We are lost without it. He was asked, well, what do you do if you're living in a time with no myths? What does a person do? And he said, well, I suppose what you have to do is develop your personal myths and you have to create your own guides for yourself until 
humanity catches up and figures out how to create the core myths that we need, such as a redefinition of the relationship with the unknown. Well, at that very time, in the early 90s, memoirs started becoming popular. And we've now had 30 years of people can't get enough of memoirs, 30 years of it. And I always connected those two. I was always curious about Joseph Campbell saying that. And, and I didn't hear him say it till 2010. I, that's when I began to study him. Um, okay. I was very curious about the relationship between him saying that and suddenly the appetite for memoirs. And now it's 30 years later and there are memoirs that much like what I've shown you here with what's happening with visual artists and what's gurgling up through the visual artist, the, um, there are some memoirs that you can see, I can see the myths are gurgling up through them. They aren't just memoirs about their work. So my interest in memoirs was because of that, that connection. And now I'm very interested, not in all memoirs, but in the ones where that is coming to the surface. Because Joseph Campbell was asked, where will the next myths come from? And he was very matter of fact of it. He said, of course, they're going to come from the artist. They're going to gurgle up through the artist. That's the, only, that's the way they always have. That's the way it will be. He's not the only one who thought that. I was at a, um, a bookstore talk with um, at Harvard Bookstore when we could still do that could still go yeah. to book talks, right? You know, I mean, I do, I go to book talks because it's the best free education um, that I can get. And there was a um, physicist who was giving a talk a number of years ago who had done a book for the popular public on quantum physics. Rendell is her last name. And it was at Harvard Bookstore. It was at three o'clock in the after, on a Friday afternoon. The room was packed and it was all packed with um, elderly, white, gray haired men. Clearly, when I listened to their lectures, they were all mathematicians and scientists and they revered this. She was a myth herself standing there talking to all of them. And after all the uh, important questions were asked, somebody said, where are the next ideas going to come from? Where will it come from? And she looked at him like, you don't know. She said, it's going to come from the artists. <laughs> she said, we all study the artists. That's what, that's what we study because it gurgles up through them. Yeah. So that's the connection. It's a long answer for that's the connection to memoir, Southern. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but I love seeing what you're doing. Jeanette, just a general comment, and I apologize, my Wi-Fi is sort of glitchy. I just loved this presentation. There were so many interesting crossovers to conversations that are happening in my design classrooms and I was just so excited to see the use of materials in these books. I have so many questions about the mass art um, book library that you were talking about. Um, and yeah, I, I, just, I just really enjoyed so much of the language in here. Thank you. You're welcome. So the mass art library is open again and you and I can arrange a time I can arrange a time when you could, they, it's not possible to show you the whole collection, but they would introduce you to some of the collection. Um, we just have to be tested, you know, so we have to, we have to get clearance to do it, but I can arrange it. I work closely with the librarians and when you're ready, you let me know because it's amazing. I love it. I feel like there are so many potential collaborations too with our classes. I'll definitely email you. One more thing that I love uh, in your presentation, Jeanette, that it connects me to one of the most exciting things in art and actually philosophy, when language being presented in letters of many languages becomes the visual form. When the letter itself, whatever language it presents, becomes the artifact, the piece of art. And when it is presented this way, the uh, contents of the presentation 
is multiplying not only for reading uh, verbs, uh, reading words, but for looking at them, for, by touching them. And uh, thus, we come back to the beginning of times when art and philosophy and everything of that kind was the oneness. Right. When it was not yet separated, running astray, now it's come together again, I guess. So that is what you're showing to us. I lost you. Jeanette? I think that's right. Yeah. Jeanette, I have a question. Uh, can I, uh, do you hear me or am I on mute? Yes, I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, have you worked with somebody who is bilingual? In the, in the meaning like, it's very interesting how the brain of bilingual people work and how it's related to the physical world surrounding them. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Bilingual or even more languages like multilingual people. Are you bilingual actually yourself? I am not. I am at the very beginning of working with um, people who are bilingual in our program. I, 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 um, so I'm at the very beginning. I am not bilingual myself. I, I actually have always been very interested in the um, in sign language and the brain and what happens there um, in terms of. Uh, that spatial relationship with letters, but no, I am not bilingual. It's because it's it's fascinating, you know. I don't consider myself to be bilingual because my English is still poor. But it's interesting, you know. I myself observe that when I am in United States, I completely forgot the names of my friends in Czech Republic, oh. and vice versa. But when I arrive in Prague and I walk through the streets, immediately remember all the names. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that that brain, you know, has something to do with the meaning of language and this, like a sort of a surrounding environment, physical environment, that it is related to physical world, you know, mm -hmm. just a little, little, you know. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's showing up in our chat here from Marika. Yes, bilinguals, Marika writes, memory is, bilingual memory is site specific. Yeah, yeah, that's what, uh, that was my question, you know, if you would like work with that also bilingual using language, you know, mm. and how it's like sort of <laughs> working with the brain. You know. it's I don't, I don't, but I make sure that there are others in our program in uh, especially one of the programs I coordinate is the first year writing program. And I make sure that we are building a group with bilingual. Yeah. Even so that I, I, I get, I get, I just, Milan, I just get people that are smarter than me to come into the program. And yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is my, this is my trick to life. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. I'm sure they are smarter than me also. You know? <laughs> but it, it was a little note, you know, because yeah. it came to my mind, you know, about the bilingual and the process of language is interesting. When you are, when you are learning language at the certain age, like children, they can learn number of languages completely instinctual. Right. And they are like a part of their brain, you know, sort of a matter. But when you start to learn English, when you are older, like in my case, when I was 33 years old, I still didn't speak a word on, of English. It was such a interesting thing, you know, because I had to translate everything through some kind of <laughs> brain, you know, shifting brain and translating and translating back through that language I grew up with. Yeah, I think the linguists, um, for people that are raising young children, I think the linguists um, say to make sure that they are exposed to the languages under the age of seven, that you're talking to them in each of the languages yeah. under that, the age of seven. I, I once made an interview with Noam Chomsky, you know, uh -oh. he told me, he told me that the language is a biological property, the same thing like your heart, your mm -hmm. liver, 
your language is a biological property. Right. So it's right. not like something which is learned. It right. is a part of the body. Right. Right. So it's interesting, you know, and when you like extend it to more dimensions, you know, like conceptual dimensions, you know, what next is a part of our bodies, you know, ethics, you know, uh, you know, morality, you know, compassion. Etc., no, they, they etc., done, which no, you no. mentioned that Campbell and compassion, you know. So that I will say something about. They have, they are, this is a discussion that goes on quite actively. Yes, indeed, language is biologically connected. You can, you can give me a few words and send me off without a lot of other human contact and I will develop language. You yeah. cannot do that with, with me with compassion. Yeah, yeah. That is a human to human transmission. Yeah, um, yeah. And they are, they feel very clear about that, that, that compassion and what you are referring to when you, when you do those, those are not, that is a human to human transmission that is, oh. mm -hmm. that is going on. And it is a different phenomena altogether and very, very important. Mm -hmm. No, it's fascinating to work with language and, you know, extension to physical <laughs> printing sort of a dimension. <laughs> So since I have you here, I actually have a question for you that's a different one, Milan. Is there some kind, I'm thinking of a small 50-year retrospective of some of the best in this Why I Write show. And I think our walls, I think we have the space that it would be quite beautiful to show some of these stories. Is there some kind of a in process I go through with you? I, I, I just just yeah. talk to me, of course, of course, it's possible. You know, it's po definitely possible. I think just it would contact me and we will go through that, you know, like sort of a, a bureaucratic process, which is very simple. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm relieved to know it's a simple one. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I I'm, <laughs> no, no, yes. Yes, my answer is yes. Thank you. Okay, I don't want to take over, you know, others ask, you know. I can talk also for hours, you know, but ask, ask, ask. I, I don't want to steal that the show. Very, that was a very interesting conversation, but I wanted to offer one more topic about books and languages and these books, which is comic books. They're novels, uh, graphic novels, which are getting more and more i would not say popular it is it is they are becoming more loved i would say and uh, even with a little children whom i taught through my practice of introducing people into art sometimes we are when we are stuck and cannot understand each other we just decide let's to make a picture about it let me show you what I think, what I mean, what I want to offer you. And thus it goes this way from the times of the caves to the times of the street art. And it is a language as well. So this interests me very much. I, I've written a little bit about this and I write when I'm perplexed because I'm trying to come out of my or, or understand it, um, the idea, the mixing of forms. So there's a book, The Photographer by Guy Bear in Lefebvre. Uh, it was a documentary photographer who followed the um, uh, Doctors Without Borders into Afghanistan, first in 86, before most people in the US knew where Afghanistan was on the map. And he went in a number of times following them in and recording. And then he talked with his friend Guibert for um, more than 10 years because they tried to figure out how to tell the story. He published his photographs, beautiful. The book is a mixture of um, graphic illustrations, finished photographs, roughed up photographs and a storyline like a comic book storyline all the way through um, and so I was socialized 
about war during the Vietnam era by the media and by the washing over and all of all of that. And it was the first time going through that book with that mixture of art forms that I was stripped of that socialization. And it was something about graphic, real image, graphic, comic line, graphic, la, 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 that it kept throwing me, I don't want to say throwing me off because it didn't feel like that, but something happened. And so I'm very interested in this graphic novel and in the comics and um, um, this piece of it, because I think there's something about helping us. I think those forms will help us reimagine the relationships that I gave hints to in my talk. Um, I think there's something there. I'm very interested in this topic, Olga. We will talk more about it. With pleasure. And then we will use our next uh, speaker, Amy, next month, who is an expert of, cre of creating the vis visual images of any kind, of any, any imaginable kind. So see how interesting and how you we have those these visual images of any how you we have those conversations. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. That's okay. That's okay. Now is the audio, I don't know if you can hear me, but your audio is coming in and out. That was a wonderful talk, Jeanette. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It gives us so much, us so much to think of. Yeah. Somehow I can hear myself through the echo. What's happening, Master Hannah? <laughs> Someone's bandwidth is not high enough. So it's. You want to ask your I question? do have a question, Janet. Uh, uh, as a graphic designer or artist, I love the the books and the experience you actually um, connect with the book. And I was wondering that in your presentation, the uh, the nice thing about uh, the books that you were showing is the experiment that you are uh, putting into these pieces, and. I wonder if someone, when they pick up a book that you've done, would have the same experience. Uh, often we uh, pick up a book and just by the sense of smell or the touch of the paper gives you a different sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And that connection to the brain makes it a very different experience than swiping something on your phone. And I was just, I really love the, the, what you're doing because of that, that connection that we have, a tact, the tactile feel with, yes. with uh, and it's just an interesting uh, thing that I would like to actually ask you if I could see one of your books so that I could experience that. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> They're lovely to touch because I was honored being allowed to touch a couple of books when we were talking into that special garden of the fifth. Yes, right. So just use the opportunity, Mario. It is quite a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Hey, Emma. Emma has a question. <laughs> Emma, do you have a question? Milan, um, then you have to unmute yourself because we cannot hear Emma if she wants to ask. Okay. Hi, if Emma. Somebody has a question. I have a question, but I am waiting. You know. Do you want somebody to ask something? We all we thought that Emma wanted to say something. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I did not want to say anything. All right, you're okay. already saying it. <laughs> so you are all good. <laughs> I. Can I, or is sure. somebody in the no, line? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. No, I know. When I was in China several times, I worked with calligraphy, 
you know, which is also like sort of a style of uh, recorded language. Mm -hmm. And what fascinated me, of course, and a lot of people don't know it, they developed calligraphy because they wanted to unite the whole Chinese em empire together with people talking different languages. The, and they developed that sort of unified way of uh, uh, recording la different languages in signs, you know, and I, I, yeah, pr uh, all of you probably know that, but not, not my students, <laughs> they were always shocked. I said it was ingenious how they just uh, shifted language into signs, you know, mm -hmm. and not only signs, but also how it is painted. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting. I was once invited on the party, which I was told they are keeping it for thousands of years. They drink a lot, etc., And they have big paper in the middle of them with a brush, you know, and paint. At, at a certain moment, somebody jumps and start to say, how about, for example, the blooming tree? And then somebody grabs that brush and make that, that calligraphy of blooming tree. Mm -hmm. But listen, then everybody is judging if it's a really blooming tree <laughs> because it's very hard to make a calligraphy of blooming tree. I didn't know that. And they, those art, lo, local artists explained to me, it is very hard to make it because each, you know, curve of that sign is telling a certain story. It is like a little poem within one sign. Yes. <laughs> you beautiful know. story, Milan. Such a beautiful so, story. So anyway, that uh, I wanted uh, to ask you if you would consider also <laughs> you know, like working with those Chinese signs in your work? It is a very special and deep uh, and deep topic. There is, the, I cannot even comprehend the hugeness of Chinese calligraphy uh, yeah, it's topic. Uh, it is Absolutely. spiritual, it is visual, it is philosophical. It is, 10th time I'm repeating this yeah. word philosophy in this conversation, but it applies perfectly well. So that is amazing, amazing topic. Amazing topic. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not qualified to talk about it. I just qualified to be in awe about it. Yeah. And how they how they actually sort of a process language being printed. It's very different. All right. Yeah, what our the worst to me? civilization using like, you know, like uh, uh, letters to create a word. <laughs> very yeah. different feel, life philosophy. These are the experts sitting yeah. there in the corner about making things out of letters. These Mario Villa design people. <laughs> I love what they do. I do love it. And we can see all the uh, visual uh, compliments that they create via their posters for 89 and via other things for us. I believe that as much as we all enjoy it, we have to thank Jeanette, we have to thank our hosters, and we have to thank each other. And we have to wait until we meet next time, right? Thank you much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was wonderful, Janet. Very nice. It was such Thank a you. wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you all. All right. Now the hostess oh, the again. Hostess again. again. Uh, so. uh, so. Now it's time now for the <laughs> 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 Спокойную ночь. Бир, бир. Спокойной ночи, sweet. Пиво, пиво.